Hello and welcome to the Voices in Montessori podcast, brought to you by the Greenspring Center for Lifelong Learning. As Dr. Montessori tells us, an education capable of saving humanity is no small undertaking. We agree. So let's get to work. I'm Tamara Sheasley Ballas, and in today's episode, we're talking about creating a classroom culture that embraces worthy challenges, problem solving, and reflection. I'm delighted to have Sherry Gardner with me today. Sherry has a master's degree in Montessori education and over 30 years of experience in the field. She's taught children's house, lower and upper elementary, served as a biomedical engineer, a university faculty member, curriculum designer, textbook author, instructional coach, and is currently an administrator in a public charter Montessori school in New Orleans. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Sherry. I have been looking forward to this. We've been trying to get you on our podcast since we started having a podcast. Thank you. It's so good to be here. Okay, so we're going to dig right in. Why is it that the focus on process rather than product is such an important idea? I mean, we know why Dr. Montessori felt like it was an important idea. Tell us why this is important still. Sure. I think that's a big question, and there is so much literature around that. But for practitioners, the important piece is that we really have to focus on what our scholars are doing rather than being driven by kind of performance outcome or measures such as grades. Um, you know, what a student can do is thought of really how do they interact with what's in front of them? How are they interacting with tasks and activities or challenges that are presented in, in the day? I think you can use other success indicators such as assessments or test quizzes, you know, exit tickets might be part of some curriculums, but there are also ways we can use projects or bigger pieces of work that really allow us to evaluate and focus on a student's thinking how they're using skills that we would like for them um, to acquire, and then the knowledge that they've gained um, for whatever you know learning goals we might have. And I think one of the beautiful things about Montessori, and we can apply both to you know our charter setting here, is that when we act in those ways, we actually create environments that are learning spaces, and we try to step away from seeing those simply as teaching spaces. So I think the easy way to sum it up is scholarly thinkers, they come as a result of rich student experiences, and it requires trust on teachers' parts and sometimes patience to let the process of learning happen. You, you're talking about really having this rich environment mm -hmm. that is learner-focused, learner-based. Talk about what that what does that look like? What does that mean? How do you make sure that the tasks are rich? So um, a couple things. In our environment, we still do focus much like a Montessori classroom on the physical design. We sometimes don't have the flexibility that um, private school settings would have because um, we have grade level standards and criteria, and we sometimes have more students than um, might be ideal in a smaller kind of environment. Um, so I think environment plays into part of this experience. But specifically to your question about tasks, you know, a rich task is basically one that gets our kids thinking. And I think most um, teachers or guides, whether you're public school, charter, Montessori, would agree that you know these these types of tasks are characterized by being engaging and challenging. You're also saying that those rich tasks make a difference cognitively. Yes, yeah. I think that one of the things that happens is whether we appeal to this identity where they are, um, you know, culturally or if it's just a piece of knowledge, being able to connect to an experience or to some prior knowledge is really, really important. I think that learning is the process of building on from where we are. I think um, we also aim to, by connecting them to something they know, we try to increase um, with a task 
just their perseverance, their overall perseverance for problem solving. So there are a lot of facets to that about questioning and, um, you know, metacognition, but really knowing that a rich task will allow them over time to work longer, to work harder, and to work deeper. And those are really important skills when we talk about scholarly thinkers. Um, we also understand that a rich task has to have the ability to connect to other things. So a task doesn't just kind of um, have a beginning and a really clean end. A good instructional practitioner will look at taking that task, whatever the, you know, the knowledge piece that they hoped would come out of it, how can we generalize that and then show or guide students to finding another way to apply it or to come up with new conclusions or to analyze in a different way, to consider a different perspective. So all of those kinds of uh, criteria I might consider, I think define a rich task. Now, one of the things I didn't say was it was procedural, it was routine, it required memorization, it required lock steps um, to get to an answer. Um, so I think that too, when you consider there are lots of questions you can ask yourself to, to ask like, is this a rich, rich task um, as well? And so the when when you're doing that work or with your teachers, because you're a school leader, you're having them ask themselves is this rich? Does this connect with other parts of their lives? Is it meaningful? Mm -hmm. right? it, is it, it does? And, and those are the pieces that really help it qualify. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I think there's another piece, um, which is the challenge level. You know, there has to be challenge and eight challenge in it. Um, there's always that kind of sweet spot in learning where you don't want it to be so difficult that um, you know, frustration sets in and, and students kind of give up, but also if it's too easy, it's unproductive. And that is absolutely not the experience scholars feel, um, to build that self-esteem or to build kind of the desire to want to know more, which, you know, in our world, we might call intrinsic motivation. So I think the challenge level is also a consideration that you, um, you know, you can't ignore. Mm -hmm. And so can you give us some practical ideas for designing, you know, these tasks? Sure. I think one of the ways is um, by asking the question, like, is it relevant? Um, mm -hmm. Does it represent some challenge? And doing your homework to know, like, given the kids that I have, challenge is going to look different. So how is it accessible at lower levels and at higher levels? After you're comfortable there, I would say, consider how you're gonna use same methods or approaches to solving a challenge, but change the problem up. So it doesn't look exactly like what they've seen before or that you know a scholar would see before. So it's kind of maybe a second level. And then your third level is, how do they use that information on something completely different? you know, really switch it up. It should be a higher level problem. Some students respond well to kind of challenge questions or um, competition where others don't really enjoy that. But, you know, finding also what motivates your students so that you get that nice learning buzz in your classroom. Um, I think those are a couple ideas that at least could start a teacher in considering a rich task and how to develop it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I have to tell you, I remember you doing this with our sixth graders. It, it, Sherry taught um, upper L, a lower L first, and then upper L for us. And I remember the six years kind of being, you know, how six years kind of get before they're, you know, they're, I'm moving up and. Oh, I do. <laughs> over upper L. And yeah. I remember you saying, oh, we are going to go. And we, and you did, I, you did a huge budget with them. Yes. Do, you, do you remember that? I do. They were in sixth grade, ready to get their own apartments and jobs. 
Right. And they wanted to know, I mean, they just couldn't believe how much money was taken out of their paycheck and how little was left for rent. It was really a good experience. But yeah, that, um, you know, just that application, again, it was a task that was so relevant. They felt so big at that moment. They had confidence and thought that they knew you know, everything they could know. Um, So yeah, it was time to kind of take it up a notch and they rose to the challenge. It was, it was really quite fun and it kind of encouraged them. They were dreaming about, you know, what would I do with this? What, what, what kind of job will I have to make money that I could, it, it takes money to, to want to do things, to be able to do things in life. So um, anyway, it was, it was a good fun project for sure. I remember that. It was, and it totally tied in because you had done all this work in math and you all should know that, you know, Sherry has a background in engineering. So she has a really strong math background so that her students really were, had just like gone deeply into the, the math curriculum and it tied all of that together right? You're, what a nice practical application for them. And it did meet them. It meet, met their need to feel, I mean, they're moving into adolescence, the toddlerhood of adulthood. They felt like they could talk about these adult things. So just really underscores a lot of what you're talking about right now, that they, they, they were create, they were solving, had to solve problems. They had to use new thinking. It was a stretch. They had to learn to use an Excel spreadsheet they had to use all those math skills. They had to create formulas, which were really, al- there's algebra formulas that you're using in your, to be able to design it. And so I just, I, I just think that's such a good example of what you're talking about and really meeting them with a stretch, but that they could actually be successful at. Right, right. Yeah, so, okay, so let's change gears a little bit here. I wanna talk about problem solving and, so, so often we assume that our Montessori classrooms problem solving is like innate in we, and of course they're solving problems, right? And, and so are you, I think you really see, and, and I remember talking to you about the things you were reading that we have to actually teach problem solving. Right. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I do. And I, when I was in the Montessori classroom, it was kind of a hard thing to talk about because I felt like in my training, um, you know, the teacher was supposed to be more invisible and the learning was supposed to come out of discoveries from the students. But um, what I did realize is that there was an important responsibility that I had to explicitly teach name and allow, maybe even create experiences for students to develop problem solving skills. So, you know, one of the people that I would go back to, um, there's, I think I, oftentimes people call it Hattie's work, but Fisher Frey and Hattie did some work on teaching strategies and the impact on learning. And they talk a lot about kind of the explicit and implicit teaching that can happen. But some of the more explicit methods that they talk about is the value of using models or exemplars, like teaching students how to examine and analyze. You know, you're not, they're not automatically, most don't wake up and know what the expectation is in a good piece of work. Um, it requires a lot of preparation on the teacher. Tasks need to be scaffolded. Um, oftentimes information has to be chunked so that they can process it in pieces. It it seems really overwhelming if you lay a problem out without kind of giving some guidance as to how to solve that problem in some steps. Um, I think a teaching approach also has to encourage that there are multiple ways to solve your problems or to analyze a text. And that's a challenge. that you have to design in your practice and create some differentiation. The one thing though, and this is where I I think I landed in a more comfortable place is that I realized explicit instruction was not monologue. You know, it wasn't the teacher standing up and just kind of uh, giving marching orders or just 
giving knowledge, just talking and talking and talking. And that should never happen. You know, dialogue between teacher and students or students and students should really be kind of the strongest part of um, that instruction, whether it be explicit or implicit. In the example that you just gave where we talked about a project for our sixth years, one of the things that, you know, the listeners might not understand is the months and months of explicit instruction that went on around what it means to be a learner, what were learning habits, what were work habits. So we defined those, we named those, we gave examples of them in some of our community meetings. And then when we experienced them in our work, we named and called it out. So we kind of, I gave um, the framework for our scholars to kind of hitch on to something, you know, was it perseverance or was it thinking flexible or, you know, there were so many, we identified several in our classroom that were important, but um, to know that defining, naming and expecting students to kind of adhere to some of those were really important with us also being able to become problem solvers. They knew what it looked like to be a problem solver. And then we had to work through how to problem solve. So there were a couple things that kind of were happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so can you give us some examples from a classroom of ways that you may see this in action in a classroom? Sure. Um, I took, and this was in a public school setting, I was very concerned about, well, here in New Orleans, um, some of my students, it was just post-COVID, and their attitudes toward learning um, were rather concerning. And I, um, I was concerned as to how we were going to kind of get over. We felt like we had so much content to teach and make up for, and we just didn't have the kids on board. So something that we did was we sat with our students, picked a simple couple group of learning behaviors, and we asked them to self-assess where they thought they were. And then at different junctures, we asked them to reconsider um, where they thought they were. We also put some tools in place. So when they did, um, you know, when they completed a rich task, we might ask them, um, what they learned, how they knew they learned it, or what they would do differently to um, kind of close that gap if they hadn't learned it the way they should have. Um, we changed some of our scoring rather than just giving A's and B's and C's. We considered ways that we could incorporate growth in to what they were doing, and they became partners in a conversation about how they had grown um, or what growth meant or setting goals for themselves. So those I think are some, I know we're kind of going into more of developing learning behaviors, but those were some real explicit ways that we um, kind of demonstrated to kids or maybe made clear what our expectations were for them to become scholars. Um, I think some of the other more instructional pieces that we really needed to adopt as teachers, which are, you know, just foundational in Montessori was, you know, to just spend a lot of time looking and listening. Um, we also wanted to challenge assumptions that our scholars were making um, to kind of name and recognize when the assumptions were incorrect, but to really also name what was correct. Um, we also looked a lot at our questioning. Like there's a lot written about questioning and, um, I know that I'll, I'll mess up the pronunciation, but Peter Liljalal, he is a Canadian who wrote, um, I think he's from Canada. Uh, he wrote a book that's a really easy read with some extremely practical techniques called Building Thinking Classrooms um, in mathematics, but you can really take a lot of the knowledge and apply it to anywhere. And he would say, you know, only ask continuing thinking questions and avoid stop thinking questions. And that became one of our mottos, that if the question you ask to kind of get your scholars engaged and to make them more aware of their processes and what they were doing, the question couldn't end with a yes, no. 
It couldn't just validate something you were thinking. Um, it had to kind of prompt them to think deeper. And then the conversation continued. So, you know, that was just a really easy piece that our teachers kind of kept as a tool in their back pocket that, you know, when we're questioning, is it a continue thinking question or is it a, an avoid or stop thinking question? Um, and then to kind of relieve ourselves of the responsibility that as the teacher or the guide, we hold all the knowledge and really letting kids and facilitating students through some of those questioning techniques or prompting, how are they going to reveal major content pieces to their peers? And um, as opposed to them waiting for us, you know, we hold this little piece of gold so sacred until somebody can guess it when really it's really not ours to own. It's, it's, it should be put out for the, the students to discover. Um, so I tried to work a lot with my teachers to relieve themselves of that pressure and that sense of responsibility that if they didn't tell students everything, then the students wouldn't be able to learn it, that they would actually be able to learn it with the right kinds of approaches. Mm. I, I think that is so important. And I saw you do that. I, I can tell you all from observing Sherry that I don't think I ever saw you ask a question that wasn't a continue thinking question. And on the flip side of that, you also never answered a student's question for them. You right. always, which takes an incredible amount of discipline. And oftentimes people become teachers because they like to give the answers. They like to solve problems. They like to talk, right? And right. So to you have to take that part of yourself and put it, so you've got to take care of those needs somewhere else because this is about the children really, as you say, becoming scholars and that there's a, that it's an art, it's an art and a science. Right. And, you know, you mentioned, and I had also mentioned the, this idea of um, kind of confidence and self-esteem. And we do a lot of work with young teachers. We did, you know, with Montessori teachers on explaining to them that confidence doesn't come from getting the right answers. You know, confidence comes from being successful in a challenge and maybe in a challenge we didn't think we could be successful at. So for us to really see ourselves in our role in developing confidence that way, um, as opposed to congratulating for right or wrong answers. And there's also a, a little piece of advice I try to tell teachers, and it takes so much um, kind of just you have to be aware of it is when kids struggle, sometimes we want to save them from the struggle. So we ask another question that might be easier, you know, oh, and if they don't get that, we're going to ask another one that was a little easier. But I would argue that the kids know exactly what you're doing. And so does everyone else in that classroom. And you didn't really build any confidence. You actually robbed them of an opportunity to struggle with it and to learn something. Um, so, you know, being that kind of a, um, a strategist as you move and, and kind of work with your students and understanding what your role is, is, is important. I hear, here. So can you talk to us about how important observation skills are, right? How are you incorporating, you know, Dr. Montessori's mandate that we be observing. Is that something that in a public setting, public charter school setting in New Orleans, you know, working with some families who really, I, I you had shared with me that school could really be uh, an oasis for them. Mm -hmm. And how important is observation in that setting? Um, Incredibly important. I think that one of the big differences in at least my um, charter and public setting that uh, compared to my Montessori experiences, there is more pressure on the teachers um, to kind of have an assurance that what they were supposed to teach was learned, that learning had occurred. Um, 
So letting that learning process breathe is very difficult. And in a modest for, um, for many, our state standards, and I think universally people would agree that not only the, the scope, but the scope with the breadth of what we're expected to teach in a year is pretty unrealistic. Um, and some may even argue not, you know, age or developmentally appropriate, but you know, that's a whole nother topic. Um, but where I do find observation being incredibly important is when we talk about creating these scholarly thinkers, and when we talk about this idea of cognitive science and how our brains act and react to what's around us. If we're not observant to what students are going through, as simple from the way they present on the day they come into school, you know, asking questions, are you okay? What's happened at home? We know that learning gets interrupted when there are not safe environments, um, when there are extreme stresses, uh, either in school or out of school. So really observing and asking questions and not stepping over some of those hard things that kids are going through and creating, um, you know, liaisons with them so they have safe people to talk to and safe places. You know, observation is really critical there. I think in a classroom, when we're instructing, observing and listening, watching, how are students reacting to what we're putting out there? Um, being reflective for ourselves and our own practices allows us to change maybe how we do it, when we did it. Um, there just are so many instructional pieces to take out of it. And the only way you're going to get that back is by observing and kind of thinking about how it's landing with the kids and in, in the students in your class. Um, I think the last part of observation that's really important is having outside observers come in and give you feedback on what you're doing how you're doing it. Um, I wish I had teachers more open to watching themselves teach on video. It's not a comfortable thing, but um, when you have somebody you can trust that can watch how you're doing things and listen to what your goals might be, uh, it's nice to have those think partners to help kind of interpret the observation so that your own biases can be challenged, your own perceptions can kind of be adjusted. And that's difficult to do if you're, you know, if you feel alone in trying to interpret observation in the classroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with you. And I think um, observation across the board so often gets skipped over mm -hmm. and we think we're, we're too busy to do it. And yet it is foundational. It's foundational in every school and, right. and really every environment. So, um, so, okay. So let's talk about, um, we know that research has determined that reflection and mm -hmm. self-monitoring is important. Yay, Montessori. Yeah. Really having that incredible insight long before we had the research. Can you talk about why it's such a critical factor in creating thinkers? Um, great question. I think this idea of reflection or metacognition, as some would say, you know, how do we think about our thinking is and has been really popular in the literature for um, a, a bit. I think the easiest way for me to get my head around it is when we as practitioners are less focused on getting and arriving at the correct solution or the right answer or something looking the way we think it should look or sound. We provide this space where reasoning happens. So we're asking our students to consider the process of their thinking and we're prompting with questions. And so this idea of reasoning fosters more thinking instead of imagine a child that knows if all I'm interested in is the, you know, getting the right answer, they realize they get the right answer, they're done. They go, she can move on from me. She goes to someone else. As opposed to me asking some more thinking questions that require my scholars to stretch. I wanna challenge them to think a little bit differently. I want to challenge their assumptions. 
And when I do that, I'm asking them to re-examine their initial kind of ideas. Sometimes they're going to come to the conclusion that they are sound. They're going to stick with their ideas. But oftentimes they, you know, with some positive encouragement, are able to understand where their misconceptions were. And it becomes a fabulous self-correction technique. And they've done it themselves. They've done it willingly. And it's a very powerful tool in developing confidence as a thinker. Um, I think that we have to allow students the time to use new information. I think we also need to tell kids, this is the way learning happens. When we think, we're actually learning. When things come really easily, learning hasn't occurred. And I would oftentimes say to my students when answers came so quickly, I would apologize that no learning happened in that moment. So we were gonna have to consider something differently. And the, your students will look at you like, what? No learning happened. I said, no, I didn't do my job well enough. That was too easy. You don't learn anything when you already know the answers. So finding kind of fun ways to consider um, how you get kids to think about their own thinking, um, you know, can can make for a really fun classroom too. Well, and I I I love the concept of really asking students to be considering their own thinking. They certainly can be doing that in elementary and adolescence, mm -hmm. and really considering how much of a stretch is it for them. Right. I'm amazed even now at how often I, when I'm digging into something that's hard, how uncomfortable I feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the classroom, I think that applies too. When they're really, really pushing themselves, we have to recognize that it can be, yes, learning can be fun, and it can be fabulous. And when we're really up against it in an area that's stretching our brain, it also is hard. It is hard. And I think for teachers to know that it's, as you said, it's okay to sit with that challenge and don't rob them of an experience by telling them how to do it or what to do, you know, as opposed to giving them feedback that allows them to kind of monitor where they are, what they know, what they don't know, where they might go. So we're giving them rather than the answer or the way to do it, we're giving them the tools they need to make better decisions related to their learning. And that is, that is hard because sometimes at the end of the class period or you have to move on and it's time for lunch and they still don't know how to solve the problem. The teacher can feel often as a failure that I didn't get the idea across. The students feel like failures. But I think to your point of doing it in a loving way and in a classroom, a very positive way, you can make fun out of it as well. It doesn't have to always be blood, sweat, and tears um, with frustration. But it also may require you to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations and that with a student, if they're really struggling with being a perfectionist or not wanting to get anything wrong or needing to get the answer right away, that's probably something that's not going to change immediately. But being patient and understanding, you know, stick to the stick to the ideals that you have, give it some time. And in time, they will they'll embrace the challenge and then truly feel successful and will be, you know, better for it. And it applies to every part of their life. Absolutely. Then they, get, then they get to be adults who have those skills because how many of us still know people who are not willing to, to not be perfect, right? They right. think that their perfection defines them and it's who makes, it's that fixed mindset piece, right? So, right. And Tamara, I'll add one other thing too, is those are, when you do develop that culture, you also have developed this classroom that celebrates this idea of risk-taking. Like we don't have to be right. That's really, we're not here to get everything right. Um, so, you know, along, and I think that's going to be a nice segue into, I think where you're going now with some of the work on, you know, uh, the learning mindsets that our students have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we create that culture and they're watching us as the models of it too. 
So mm -hmm. um, the only thing I wanted to ask you before we move on to mindsets, can you talk to us about just self-correction and the how you support children in building um really being willing to examine their own processes around that. Sure. Um, I, now the answer is good. You know, I'm going to be picturing an example in my head and of course it's not going to work in every situation, but in general, I really think that if we focus on encouraging that discourse with our students and getting them to think and express um, how they're thinking, you know, can you tell me the steps you went through or how did you get to that answer? Oftentimes when they step through that, they can find areas where they made perhaps a mistake in their thinking. Sometimes it might be a simple mistake, a calculation in a math problem or the use of a verb or a pronoun in a, a piece of writing. Um, but it might be bigger things as well that they begin to identify and they begin to kind of shake up like, oh, maybe something I thought was always true, doesn't work all the time. So, you know, going back to our questioning techniques, the prompts we might use, um, you know, not answering questions for them, but allowing them to kind of elaborate. Those are, are big things. The other thing is, is I love to watch what they're doing, build on what they do know. So let's say you've asked a student to do something and you're looking at a piece of work that they have or, a, you know, something in front of you as opposed to looking at the things that weren't right with it, start from where they kind of left off of what they did know. And then how do we build off of that with some really positive, constructive suggestions? Um, you're really being a, almost like a master at setting them up to find that mistake. You might see it already and immediately, but um, having the control to not point it out to allow them to find it is so much more powerful. Um, I think also when they find those misconceptions in their thinking, if you name it, you identify it, it's also really powerful because they realize there are other people that think this way. This is a thing. It's not just, I'm not smart or I can't do this. Um, it is, I think, always comforting to know that Many people struggled in the same way. And then again, yay, I did it. You know, I got through this. I wonder if everybody gets through it. Maybe some people don't. Um, so that kind of feedback is important. And then lastly, if there's ways for you to give them even data, you know, I, some, I use the example of using exemplars, using models, maybe solving a problem and letting them look through it. Um, but ways for them to collect data, even if it's just, this is how I feel about me as a learner this week, or I can learn new things when last week I didn't think I could. And this is the proof that I did learn new things. Providing them with a way to record, whether that's just in reflection or if it's with some hard data, I think that gives them a way to self-monitor. And that can be really motivating in terms of developing um, the ability to self-correct. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. I love that list. I think I, I need to go back and take notes on that list. <laughs> Great list. So you've referred a little bit to mindsets. So let's talk about Carol Dweck's work on mindsets and the impact of mindsets on learning. And how does that work with and other research have an impact on creating scholars that are really thinking? Sure. Um, yeah, Carol Dweck is probably a name that, you know, a lot of uh, educators have, um, you know, read or heard about. And I'm going to throw out another name for the Matthews who are listening. Um, Joe Bowler also did some work with Carol Dweck on, um, you know, mathematical mindsets, which again, I fully believe that a lot of the work that's done around math can be applied to anywhere. Um, to any subject. But um, I think what really my takeaway from the research um, is that it shows that if we have scholars that kind of adhere and believe that they belong in a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset, 
but that this growth mindset allows them to adopt new learning behaviors. So they can learn new things, that their learning isn't fixed, um, that they weren't born good at math or good at reading, and they can't learn um, to develop new skill sets around that. So if they believe in this growth mindset and they can adopt these new learning behaviors, that ultimately influences learning outcomes. And they had the ability to do that and only they can control that, right? There's the importance of positive messaging about growth and the importance of making mistakes is so important. And I think in a lot of the work we do, enlisting parents on that idea is really important as well. We can do a lot of work in the classroom and our school communities uh, about the value of mistakes and the value of um, leaving space for growth and learning to happen. And then if they go home and they have parents and that are, you know, their high pressure environments and test scores and standardized scores and, you know, being the top in the class are the most important things that can be quite defeating and they're hearing very different messages. So I think that knowing or having parents understand if teachers do use this mindset approach to some of the work they're doing in the classroom, kind of being transparent about that. I find that, you know, I always want, I say to my teachers, the ownership for learning should be on our scholars, not on us. Like I already did sixth grade, right? I, I passed, I went on, it's their turn now and they have to own it. And the only way we can really do that is to try to encourage this intrinsic motivation. And for me, that means we have to help them embrace and value the struggle, that it's okay to struggle. So one of the things that I've always done is had really frank discussions with our students about how the brain grows, what happens when the brain is actually learning and talk about the science of the dendrites and things that, um, you know, what happens when we struggle versus what happens when we don't struggle. So I think that creating, again, that culture where growth rather than correct answers is the driving force is really, really important to this mindset work that, you know, we know to be so valuable. Mm, mm, mm. I, I love that. And I have not actually heard it framed like that and really thought about how explicitly we need to teach those skills to make sure that they have that framework. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times I think we think about a child naturally coming in with one or the other. And yes, we work with them some, but Really, this to me feels like a full court press on the whole class having these concepts and these ideas and where let's make room for errors and mm -hmm. is there only one right answer and how do we solve this together and all of those pieces. So I love that. I love that. We are unfortunately very close to out of time. It's been is there anything else you want? You have a burning desire. We have to know. Is there anything else that you want to make sure we cover? I think just one kind of um, closing comment that I think it's, I just cannot say enough about all of the um, individuals that go into this profession, you know, to teach. It is perhaps the hardest work in the world. And it's not work oftentimes we can control these outcomes, but yet we're measured by them, you know, about how other human beings perform. And that is really, really hard. But I think to leave us with the idea that it's not just the work we do, but as we create these communities in these learning cultures in our classroom, you know, our, our students are part of uh, making this prof this process so perfect. You know, when we rely on the students to encourage each other and we know that when one is better, we all get better, um, I think is really important and it might allow us to take some of the pressure off ourselves and that we're the facilitator of all of this and that 
you know, if we believe that from us, some great things are going to come, if we don't overly control it and we allow partnerships with others, you know, we're, we're bound to be successful. We can't not be. Mm. Here, here. Well said. And I do think, I think that teaching is, I think it's the most important profession. I really do. It is, it is, does it, we are guiding and really, um, completely impacting the future of our world every day, every day. Agreed. Thank you Agreed. so much for being here, Sherry. It's been so fun to talk to you. I wish we had another hour just so we could chat and catch up, <laughs> but you we'll go offline and we'll do that. Nobody that, wants to hear about that. <laughs> that's right. But I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate your, appreciate your expertise and the, the, wisdom and depth of knowledge and the joy you bring to this work. And really, again, your your just your competence is just so beautiful. And it's been well, a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And Tamara, thank you for all the work that you're doing with, you know, the Green Spring work and the Green Spring voices and, you know, best of luck to everything you're doing. I The world needs more people like Tamara and Green Spring. Oh, well, that's very kind. I, I feel I have to tell you doing this podcast is one of my favorite things now because I get to talk to people and the and be inspired and 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 bring this out to the world. And I feel like it's a such a blessing. So thank you. Well, thank you. It was a joy and honor to be here. I appreciate you. Appreciate you too. And <laughs> listeners, we appreciate you all too so much. Uh, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and hear the latest episodes and join in the conversation on Facebook and Instagram. Take a look at our website at greenspringcenter.org to view the show notes from today's episode and to find information on the books that Sherry referenced today. Thank you so much for your time. Your work is so important. I think Sherry and I agree. It is the most important work and we're here to help. Join us next time.